Many of Puma's advanced features, such as coaxial epi-illumination, augmented reality projection, and binocular and trinocular viewing, depend on optical beam splitters in the advanced filter block and binocular head modules. In this video, I'll discuss the beam splitter components of both those modules and show how to make the advanced filter block. A full discussion of the binocular head module will be the subject of a separate video. First, I'll give you some context so you can understand how the Puma filter blocks and ocular heads fit into the overall scheme of the microscope. A generic compound microscope takes a real image of a specimen which is a certain distance close to an objective lens and magnifies that image further with an ocular lens. By arranging it so that the real image from the objective falls onto the back focal plane of the ocular, you get a situation where you can look comfortably into the far distance through the ocular lens to see the magnified image of the specimen. Using a simple lens as objective results in chromatic and spherical aberrations of the image, so microscope objectives use lens combinations to reduce these aberrations to a minimum. However, these corrective effects only take place optimally when you focus the image at a certain distance away from the objective. You could focus the image further away or closer than this optimum distance by simply moving the specimen closer to or further from the objective, but then the image would lose those optimum aberration corrections. So, it is important that the image from each objective is focused only at the optimum distance it was designed for. Over the years, microscope manufacturers settled on certain standards for this optimum distance, and the most commonly used standard until the uptake of infinity optics, which I'll discuss shortly, was 150 millimeters from the flange of the objective to the focal plane of the ocular. A notable exception to this were objectives made by lights, which were designed to give optimal corrections when the image is focused at 160 millimeters from the flange of the objective. This optimum distance is sometimes called the optical tube length. The objective is rigidly held at this optimum distance from the eyepiece by the mechanical tube of the microscope, and for practical reasons, the length of this tube is measured from the flange of the objective to the flange of the ocular. This length of physical tubing is called the mechanical tube length of the microscope. Another standard adopted by microscope manufacturers is that there shall be exactly 10 millimeters from the flange of the ocular to the focal plane of the ocular inside the mechanical tube. Thus, the mechanical tube length is exactly 10 millimeters longer than the optical tube length. This means that most non-infinity objectives should be used with a mechanical tube length of 160 mm, and this is the Royal Microscopical Society, or RMS, standard, although lights continued to use 170 mm tubes for their objectives long after the RMS standard was adopted by other manufacturers. The mechanical tube length appropriate for any objective is printed on the barrel of the objective as is shown here. Another standardized feature, which is not the same standard for all microscopes, is the par focal distance, which is related to the conjugate focal distance of the objective. The conjugate focal distance is the distance between the focal plane of the specimen and the focal plane of the image of the specimen produced by the objective. To keep objectives par focal, they are designed such that the distance from the flange of the objective to the specimen in focus is constant regardless of the magnification of the objective. For Puma and many other professional microscopes, this distance is 45 millimeters. So, when you add this 45 mm to the 150 mm from the objective flange to the focused image, you get a total of 195 mm. So, when you see objectives being described as 195 objectives, this is what it means. 
Some other objectives have a parfocal distance of 35 mm, so these are described as 185 objectives. These will not work with Puma because there is not enough travel distance in the stage to move the specimen the extra 10 mm closer to the objective that will be required to get it in focus. One other distance term worth noting is the working distance of the objective, defined as the distance from the front lens element of the objective to the closest surface of the cover slip when the specimen is in focus. As microscopes got more complex, they required additional accessories such as binocular heads, teaching arms, camera ports, epi-illumination prisms, etc. This made it necessary to extend the microscope tube length. So, expensive collimating and decollimating optics were needed for each accessory to lengthen the amount of optical path available before the image is brought to a focus. Collimation is also required to minimize the aberrations and ghost images introduced by the flat surfaces of prisms. Infinity corrected objectives were developed to avoid these problems. With these objectives, with the specimen at the correct working distance from the objective, the image beam exiting the back of the objective is already collimated as a parallel beam, so it comes to a focus at infinity. This allows you to use any number of beam splitters in the parallel beam path for various accessories without needing a pair of collimating and decollimating lenses for each one. Only one final converging tube lens is required to focus the final image on the focal plane of the oculars. So in these systems the mechanical tube length is marked as infinity on the barrel of the objective. This Puma Foundation scope illustrates how Puma implements the various distances we have been discussing. With the standard 1mm quick release objective holder, the level of the flange of the objective is the top surface of the focus plate. So you can see that from here to the specimen is 45 mm of par focal distance, and from here to 10 mm below the ocular flange is the 150 mm of optical tube length for the objective, the extra 10 mm to the ocular flange completing the 160 mm of RMS standard mechanical tube length. Puma also has a 10 mm extra elongated ocular holder as an alternative to the standard ocular holder, which you can use if you are using light subjectives which need a 170 mm mechanical tube length. Two important design constraints of Puma are portability and affordability. These prohibit the use of collimating and decollimating lenses due to the fact that they would greatly increase the cost of production, be difficult for ordinary people to source, and would increase the size and weight of the scope. For these reasons, all of Puma's advanced features, including the binocular head, were designed to fit into the literal 150 mm of focusing space behind the objective to result in a very compact, economic and lightweight scope designed to use RMS standards. Above the objective holder is the filter block, which may be simple with no internal optics, or advanced with an internal beam splitter and an optional tube lens for use with infinity corrected objectives. Note that they are exactly the same height as each other, so are interchangeable depending on your needs. Above the filter block is the final 90 mm of objective focusing space. This 90 mm may be used by a straight optical path for the monocular head module you see here. Alternatively, the same 90 mm may be folded by a beam splitter and three mirrors into the adjustable binocular head shown here. This results in an even more compact scope. However, the use of beam splitters without collimation corrector lenses brings with it several compromises in optical quality, which will be introduced in the next section. Before I move on to the next part of this video, I would ask that if you like these Puma videos, please take a second to support the project by clicking on the big red subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. 
If you have social media accounts, also please share these videos on them using the YouTube Share button. OK, now back to the rest of this video. There are several types of optical beam splitter, and each type can also be used as a beam joiner. The two types that were considered for use in Puma are the splitter plate and the splitter prism cube. The beam splitter plate is a thin plate of glass coated with a semi-reflective coating on one side. A beam splitter cube is made of two prisms that sandwich a coating in between them. It is important to appreciate that there is no single best type of splitter for all applications. Each has its own advantages and limitations, as shown in this summary. I decided to use the thin plate beam splitters for Puma because they better satisfy the Puma design constraints of affordability, being many times cheaper than the cubes, and portability, because they take much less space to mount and are lighter. Also, Puma uses converging rather than collimated imaging beams, and so would require expensive additional correction optics and longer tube lengths if cube splitters were used. This would greatly increase both expense and bulk. This does mean, on the other hand, that Puma design and construction methods had to be carefully tailored to minimize the unwanted effects of the plate splitters. For example, careful design of the mounts were needed to avoid putting pressure on the splitter plates to avoid deformation of the glass, resulting in astigmatic aberrations. Listen to this. That is a good sound. It means that the splitter plate is free to rattle, and so no lateral pressure is being put on it. I'll discuss these important construction details later in the video. The ghost image reflection of the plate splitters used in Puma is very faint and is not noticeable in most normal bright field viewing conditions, but may sometimes be seen in some dark field settings, especially on the trinocular port, because that takes its image reflection after first hitting the plain glass surface of the beam splitter before reaching the coated semi-reflective surface. Again, Puma's careful design and construction techniques were deliberately chosen to minimize this, and so it's important to follow the Puma build instructions carefully to get the best quality image results. For example, the trinocular port is designed to only be used with a rotatable polarizer, which can help filter out some of the ghost image component. Unfortunately, no affordable or practical optical correction has been found for Puma to ameliorate the chromatic and spherical aberrations caused by light passing through the beam splitters. Although these effects are small for the thin plate splitters used in Puma, they are noticeable, so it is always best practice to use the minimum number of beam splitters required for your application. For example, if you don't really need the binocular head, then don't use it. If you do need the extra filter slot provided by the advanced filter block, but have no intention of using the augmented reality heads-up display or epi illumination or trinocular features, then don't add the beam splitter when constructing the advanced filter block. Here is a simplistic diagram of the beam path for the advanced filter block. To demonstrate the beam splitter effects in practice, I'll be using these metal-coated semi-frosted glass discs as light beam detectors. They will illuminate when the light beam enters them. Here is the advanced filter block with its beam splitter in situ. The objective lens and specimen will be down here, and the ocular head up here. This would be the side of the epi-illuminator or trinocular camera port, depending on which configuration you have set up. And this will be where the light from the augmented reality heads-up display projector will come in. The coated surface of the beam splitter is facing the augmented reality heads-up display port. Because this needs to direct a high-quality image of the augmented reality heads-up display up to the ocular head. The non-coated surface of the splitter 
faces the epi illumination port because it does not matter if we get a ghost image of the uniform illumination beam due to reflections of the uncoated surface because this beam is directed down to the sample to illuminate it. This shows why it is important to orientate the beam splitter correctly, as will be discussed later. However, if you have no intention of using the heads up display, then it would be better to insert the beam splitter with the coated surface facing the trinocular port so you can get a higher quality image from there. In this configuration, I have the light source at the bottom simulating transillumination microscopy. When I switch on the lamp, you can see how the beam splitter splits the light from the transilluminated specimen 50 50 between the main ocular head and the trinocular camera port. The port of the augmented reality heads up display is not illuminated other than by light passively reflected from any object in the opposite arm of the beam path. Now I have put the light source in the epi illumination position where the trinocular camera port was previously. I have also put a reflecting disc in the position of the specimen with a red filter on it to simulate light reflecting from an epi-illuminated specimen. This time, when I switch on the lamp, light reflects 50-50 at the beam splitter with half of it going to waste by illuminating the augmented reality heads-up display port and half of it directed downwards to the red reflective specimen. And you can just make out a faint red signal in the ocular detector, which is the light reflecting up from the specimen, only 50% of which gets through the beam splitter, hence the very weak signal. Regarding the large amount of light going across to the augmented reality heads up display port, this light can reflect back onto the beam splitter, and 50% of that back reflected light will be reflected up to the ocular head to dilute the signal from the specimen. It is for this reason that special light sinks must be used when doing epi-illumination, and more will be said about those in a separate video on epi-illumination. Now, if I replace this light detector in the augmented reality heads-up display port with another light source, a blue light, the blue light representing the light coming from the augmented reality heads-up display projector, you can see that the blue light beam is reflected up to the ocular where it merges with the image of the light coming from the objective. This is the same whether using epi illumination, as shown here, or in the transilluminated configuration, as shown here. In this transillumination setup, note how the signal from the augmented reality heads up display and the objective are simultaneously present at both the standard ocular port on top and the trinocular port on the side. I'll now demonstrate the beam splitter for the binocular head using the same apparatus. Note how when I turn on the light the beam gets divided equally between the upper and lower output ports. So now that you have learned about the beam splitter systems and seen them in action, I'll show you how to build them. These are the parts and the tools you'll need to build the beam splitter for the binocular head module. There are two optics. One is a fully silvered mirror, which is a first surface mirror, and the other is your semi-silvered plate beam splitter. And it's important with this to identify which surface has the semi-silvered coating and which surface doesn't. And you can do this by looking at the reflection, looking at a reflection, and the surface that has the coating makes it difficult to see the underside edge. So this is the surface with the coating. If we look at the other side, and we look at a reflection, you can see the under surface edge very clearly, despite the reflection. So this is the uncoated surface. So we need to identify the coated surface, because that has to go a specific way in the beam splitter. The first thing to do, 
as always, is to clear the print of any stray plastic threads and remove any supports and other non-printed components. So in here, we'll need to remove this. For example, and this. Also, it's a good idea to thread all the holes before we put the beam splitter together. So these three here, these three here, these four, and these two. And on the other component, the same three, three holes there. So I'll do that first by threading them with a M3 screw, carefully and slowly threading them in. And after this is complete, and after I've removed all the threads and cleaned up the prints, we'll go on to see how to insert the optics and complete the assembly. Okay, so I've threaded all the holes and I've cleaned up the part. And you can see the uh, threads here, for example, and in these holes here, for example, and all of these four holes down here. Now, one thing I want to point out is this groove that we have running along the inside here. So you notice there's a groove here, and that goes all the way down inside. And on the other side as well, there's a groove that begins here and goes all the way down. And that's to give these side parts a hinge-like spring action. So we can open them out a bit and push them in. And that's important when we come to fit the optics. But before we do that, I'll show you how this part fits together. So this is the backing plate and the top cover, light cover. And this fits on slides on with these two sharp edges here going into these two grooves here. And it slides on like so. Okay. Now that's not completely light tight at the back here around these edges, but if you wanted to, you could seal those with black tack or something like that. Now at the bottom, you'll notice we have a raised ridge, and that raised ridge is to accept this cutout part of the base. Okay, and so this fits on like so. And so the whole thing fits together with screws, as I'll show you in a moment. But first, we will apply the optics. And to do that, we first apply the mirror. We'll need to separate the edges. So I'll use this, which is a penny coin. And i use this because it's exactly two centimeters in diameter, and it has a smooth surface to it. Uh, so it's easy to insert. So what we need to do is insert that into here, and we need to adjust it so that it's right on the edge. This is a bit fiddly. There we are. So now, if I bring that close to the camera, you see that the penny is off the ridge, but it's holding these things apart. And now we can insert the mirror. So here we have the mirror. And that goes with its surface facing downwards into this groove like so. So hold it vertically and insert it into the groove. And once it's in the groove, all the way down, there we are. So once it's in the groove like that, you can take off the penny. And that is now held in place. Okay, in its groove, check that it's in the groove, like so. And now we turn our attention to the semi-silvered mirror. 
Now it's important with the semi-silvered mirror that you use the uh, identify the coated surface and the coated surface must face the outlet. Okay, so the coated surface must point outwards and that just slots in here and it should be a nice loose fit. Let's put my finger there to stop it falling out. Hold it vertically and it goes in there like that. Okay. And now, careful not to turn it the other way around until we've inserted the coverings, otherwise it will fall out. So now we will put the um, backing on, and then the cover. And if this is worked well, it should rattle. Hear that? That's a good sound. So now your beam splitter is assembled. We need to just insert the screws to complete the assembly. And it's important to hear that rattling sound because you do not want the beam splitter to be held rigidly in place otherwise it will result in deformations and astigmatism. There we are. And in regards to the dust, use an air duster. These are the parts and the tools you'll need to build the advanced filter block. The quick release mechanism for the stage and the RMS thread were described in the video on how to build the foundation scope, as was the base thread of the simple filter block and the two lower filter slots held together by these four screws. Here you can see the simple filter block with those components in place. The only difference in this case is that instead of these screws going into the simple filter block base, they will instead fit into the base of the beam splitter casing of the advanced filter block. So I won't repeat the details of construction of those lower parts here. In addition to printing the beam splitter casing and the upper components, including the upper filter block, you should also print some of these aperture protection plugs so that you can prevent dust from entering into the system when not in use. Now there are two optics that we use for the advanced filter block, only one of which is essential, and that is this semi-silvered beam splitter plate, which is exactly the same as the plate beam splitter used in the binocular head construction. This lens is a 100mm focal length lens. As you can see here, it's a doublet lens. And this is only used as an option for those who want to use infinity corrected objectives in the microscope. For most normal use, we do not use that infinity tube lens. Now, the first step, as always, when constructing, is to clear away any stray plastic threads and any 
non-printed parts. And again, I would advise that we thread these holes prior to inserting the splitter glass to avoid manipulating the beam splitter block and getting dust everywhere after inserting the optics. So I'll clean up these prints, I'll thread the holes, and we'll come back to the rest of the construction. Now I've cleaned up the prints and I've threaded the holes, as you can see here, for example. Holes have got threads in them. These are with M3 screws. These are with M2 screws, and these are also M2 screw threads. As for the top parts of the assembly, these holes on the side are larger than the holes on here, because these holes are meant to accept M2 screw to go straight through it, not to be threaded, so like that. Whereas these other holes, the smaller ones, are intended to be threaded by an M2 screw, so they are smaller. So first we'll assemble these top components, which is the upper filter slot and the cavity for the optional infinity tube lens. So this is the very topmost component, and under here we have a hexagonal recess, which is for an M3 nut, like that. So that needs to be pushed in there with some pressure. And you can pull that all the way through by putting a screw in from this end and pulling it through. Okay, so now this is the under surface, this is the top surface. So we want the four longer M2 screws to go in here. And these holes are not supposed to be threaded, so the screws just go through like that. Okay, and then this is the front, this is the back. You put on the filter, top filter slot. Top filter slot opening must face the back. And these ridges on the filter slot at the bottom here, these are the bottom ridges. You can just see that on edge there, it's a slight ridge. That's the bottom. So it goes in like this with the ridges facing downwards. And again, these holes are not supposed to be threaded. The screw is supposed to go straight through it, although it may be printed a bit tight. And so you may need to widen the holes a bit with some implement if the screw doesn't go through. And if you do that, if you widen the hole, make sure that you clean away the top surface, any plastic that's been squashed out, because you want this surface to be flat. You don't want any uh, extruded plastic, pushed out plastic, to be proud of the surface. Okay, so this is the bottom aspect, and we want this to therefore be fitted like that, through these M2 screws through those holes. And if it's still a bit too tight, you can just thread them through, but the thread is not supposed to catch. So that one is very tight still, even though I've widened the hole. So I'll just do that. And so I've threaded it all the way to the end, even though they're not meant to be threaded holes. So because they're a bit tight, I had to thread them. So I advise once you've got it all the way to the end, before you do anything else, deliberately break the thread by moving the screw around clockwise a few times. And that should break whatever thread that you've done, because you don't really want a thread on the filter part. Okay, 
And now we can fit it to the receptacle for the infinity tube lens. And this is symmetrical, there's no front or back as such, but you just need to make sure that these uh, lips here, these flanges, face downwards. Okay, so that can go on like that. So the flanges face downwards. That's the important orientation here. And now these are threaded holes, or well, holes that should be threaded. So you carefully and slowly thread this in. Okay, so now that's ready. The next thing to do is just to put these shorter screws through here, ready to connect to the main splitter case. If you were going to use the Infinity Tube lens, that would go inside this cavity. And if you have a lens like this, if one of the surfaces is more curved than the other, I would use the more curved surface to face the splitter block and the flatter surface to face upwards. And that will go inside here, all the way in. Like so. So that would be how you would insert the um, infinity tube lens. And that would go on to the uh, splitter block like so when we insert it. But I'm not going to use the infinity tube lens. So we'll just push that up. Okay. But that's how you would do it if you wanted an infinity version. So now we have the top part. And here is the bottom part which I prepared earlier. So this is the RMS thread adapter. And this is the base thread. And they will uh, screw together. And these um, grub screws will be used to fix it in place. But I'm not going to attach this just yet. Here are the two lower filter slots and the base thread. We'll use that in a moment. So now to inserting the splitter glass into the splitter block. And the way to do this is first you have to separate these two arms a bit. And we do that with a penny. And you want to insert the splitter glass such that the coated surface of the a splitter glass faces this open edge. Okay, so it's going to be like that, and the coated surface has to be facing this side, this side, not that side. Okay, so we'll get our penny and we'll insert it. So one penny piece. We'll insert it just underneath here because you want to insert the penny on the side opposite the coating, not on the coating side in case it touches the penny. We don't want to damage that coating. So the penny is now inserted. It's widened out the um, arms of the splitter block. So we can now insert the splitter, the coated surface, which is this surface here. That's the coated surface. And that is going like so. So we hold it vertically. Put a finger here in case it falls to catch it. And then we'll put it into the yeah, like that. Carefully. There it is. And once it's in, just make sure it's in the groove. We can then carefully remove the penny. And if it's properly in the groove, should be able to hear it rattle. Mm. 
Okay, so that's done properly. And now, i can put the cover on. Now this cover has got grooves, you can see there, two grooves, one, two, to fit into these, tongue and groove. These are light seals to prevent light from getting in. And put it in the right way up, where you have this depression for the infinity lens. Okay, not, don't do it that way. That would be a mistake. So that's the correct way up. So those tongue and grooves fit into each other. And then we fix that in place with these two screws. Make sure the screws go all the way in till they stop, but don't over tighten them because it's very easy to break an M2 metal on plastic thread. Also be careful not to slip or the Allen key may scratch the surface of your beam splitter. This is the side of the coated surface. There we are. So there we are. And before I go any further, I will protect exposed edges with these protector caps like that. Now we can insert the top and bottom components. So we see here the four M2 screws with these curved parts. That is for the top part. Now, the bit that we have just screwed on with screws, that is the um, front. That's where the augmented reality projector is going to go. So we know that this is also front, so it has to be like this, okay? So the part with the two screws and the lug both facing the same direction. And screw these in. When you come to the end, just be careful again not to put too much pressure on these M2 screws or you'll destroy the thread. You don't want to see a gap in there, okay, in here. And again, we will protect it. So there's our splitter. Put a protector. And lastly, we'll put the bottom two. Remember the openings of the filter slots face the back, same direction as the opening for the upper filter slot. So it's like that. As we come to the end, just be careful not to put too much pressure on the threads to damage the plastic on metal threads. You want it firm, but not tight as you would some old metal construction.
your advanced filter block is now ready to use, and the beam splitter for your binocular head module is also ready to be incorporated into the binocular head, which I'll show you in another video. Please remember to subscribe, like, comment and share this video to support the Puma Open Source Microscopy project. Thanks for watching.